Hi, this is Gabrielle Hayes. I'm the co-founder of Cat Dog Fish. We are here for the next installment of our of our podcast series, and I'm joined by Dr. Chris Tufnell. We Hi. are at Chris's surgery um, in Crookham Common in West Berkshire. Dizzy and Tiggy, Chris's two lovely yet slightly odd-looking dogs, are here in the studio <laughs> with us. They are very, very sweet. So if One you hear of any- my vets the other day actually said to me when I took them in to have their teeth cleaned, he said, "What do you, what do you feed your dogs?" And I said, <laughs> "I said, are you are you saying they're fat?" I'm afraid both the girls are probably just slightly heavier than they might have planned. Well, you know, but life is short, so <laughs> whatever. We'll get to we'll get to pet obesity yeah. in in yet another podcast because that is a very interesting topic. However, yeah. today what we're going to be talking about is as a pet owner and a pet parent, I take my cats, Henry and Charlie, into the vet. Yep. I drop them off. They go behind the screen, and I don't always know what's going on. So. You're in the hot seat, you're a vet, you're here to tell us what happens behind the curtain. What do you do when you take that animal in, dog, cat, or otherwise? I think think we should talk about the the bit before the curtain as well, though, because that's really critical. All right. What's that bit? Well, when you bring bring them in for a consultation. Yeah. So you're stood in the room with us. With my crazy, feral cats who I have struggled to get into the cat carrier. They are miserable and whining. And and you mean that, that, those few minutes? Well, yeah, those few minutes, definitely. It's it's so traumatic for me. I feel so horrible the whole time. Well, I think definitely um, we should talk about Fear Free in another um, another podcast. Fear Free. Fear Free. And it's really important. and, And everybody can go and look at this. If you've got an animal that hates coming to the vet... The, the whole thing about a visit to the, uh, to the vet has started way, way, way before they come into the surgery. So actually, the experience in the, in the examination room isn't the only thing that triggers that fear. They've, they've started the fear right from the moment you try and grab them to put them into the... Well, they the have a cat. sixth sense about when I reach up for the cat carrier. So there's yeah, I, loads I of good reasons why, why we look into... All those things that that play into their um, fears, and we try and make the whole experience from beginning to end. So f- from the moment that you put them in the cat carrier uh, to the end, as good as possible. So there's loads we can talk about on that. But what I'm really interested in talking about is 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 what actually happens in the examination room. Because I think that a lot of people assume that there's this some form of magic that happens in that 10 to 15 minutes when you plonk your animal on the table um, that means that we're going to give you an answer to go out the door with and 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 we need for a starter we call it taking a history but all it is is just getting the story from you we need as much information from you as we can possibly get about what you are worried about but don't don't pet parents know that or do you find that they come in and they just don't have any idea about uh, particularly if they've adopted an animal how often do pet parents not have the information you need well most people have had a trigger for what what uh, for the reason that they're bringing the bring the animal in but when you start to earn a lot of money, Gabrielle, you'll um, buy a house in the country. And uh, um, <laughs> it, it just note for listeners, I have never lived in the country and never will. I'm <laughs> as much a city dweller as as it you could ever get. And the so, fact that I'm in West Berkshire is I had to crack open my passport. But anyway, yes, do do proceed, so we Dr. Are, we are an, <laughs> at, We're about an hour from, from central London. There are a lot of people who have places in the country. <laughs> and, and there are some people in this area who have housekeepers uh, mm-hmm. in their place in the country during the week and their pets stay in the country, which is great for the pets. They've got a lovely yeah. big garden and they get great walks in the countryside. But very often the pets get sent in to us with the housekeeper or uh, uh, or the gardener who has not a clue why they've been t- told to take the animal to the vet. So instantly, we've got an arm tied behind our back because we're not being told even the reason that the pet's in front of us. And, uh, and then we try and ring the owner and find out, and the owner's presumably very busy in London and difficult to get hold of. And, because they have uh, to earn money to pay your fees. That's why. Exactly right. Exactly right. So <laughs> it, to, to us, that story, that history is really critical. And we need as much information as, as you possibly can tell us. Because quite often, your principal concern, so my animal's coughing or my animal's vomiting, is 
is not directly related to the reason that they're um, ill in the first place. It might not be their main problem. So the more information we get in that that stage, the better. And and communications are two way thing. So there needs to be a sender and a receiver. So. I am not for a minute saying that we don't have a role to play there. We need to be good listeners. And with a lot of vets... And do they teach you that in in vet school? Yeah, it's certainly mentioned. But for a lot of vets, they're under time pressure. There are so many animals to see in in an hour. And uh, and there is a, a tendency to want to interrupt. As far as we know, the um, average length of time it takes a vet to interrupt an owner in that history stage is... 20 seconds 20 seconds 20 seconds which is not something we as vets are terribly proud of i have to be honest who who on earth timed it it was was i mean how did you find that out well there's a (laughs) there there are several organizations out there that that do fly on the wall studies of what we do and and stuff and 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 really really important stuff because we need to we need to know because we need to be self-critical we need to know when we're not doing so well and um that's the one area that we probably need to to think very carefully about is making sure that that we're listening to what you're telling us so that we pick up on those subtle things. We, we get some people come into us and say, the animal's just not right. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, and we examine the animal. So that's the next stage is to perform a thorough clinical examination. And we examine the animal and we can't find anything wrong. Now, the worst thing we can possibly do there is start having an argument with you as to whether we think there's something wrong or not. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't find anything wrong, but you're telling us the animal's not right. You guys know the animals far better than we do. You Mm -hmm. see them all the time. And and very often, the reason we can't find something wrong is just because we haven't looked in the right place yet. Well, can you tell if an animal's depressed? Yeah, I think most of us are aware of. Um, so, so maybe, maybe just for the benefit of listeners, I should let everybody know that we've got um, two dogs, two cats, two sheep, two goats, uh, one gerbil, um, uh, half a dozen um, fish, and, fish, and fish. A, Let's and a not dozen, forget the fish. We mustn't forget the fish and a dozen chickens. So, so I am um, a, a, as a pet parent myself. I'm really experienced with the idea of. Uh, animals being down and being dull and and depressed and whether they have the same mental anguish as we have when they're down and depressed I don't know and I think that's a really interesting thing to talk about and that's a topic for another day that we will absolutely get into we will definitely check the space but 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 whether they have that I don't know but but the truth is that we certainly can tell all of us as pet parents know when they're having an off day and um just to, just to use as an example, there, there is one um, um, fireworks night many, many years ago, my first year in practice, so um, when we were going around on horse and cart. Um, the, <laughs> the, um, and, there was, uh, and this chap rang me up at, at about nine o'clock at night on fireworks night. I was about to watch a display and said that he wanted me to see his dog straight away because it wasn't jumping up onto the... Uh, onto the um, sofa and he knew that when it wasn't jumping up onto a sofa it needed its anal glands squeezed it's now, anal glands squeezed absolutely so so you as a cat oh. owner are probably not so experienced <laughs> with the idea of anal glands but I'm dogs have these in my glands. seat dogs have these glands which are designed to effectively put a signature on each dropping so that they're leaving a message for other dogs that uh-huh. they've been in an area so okay when marking you, their territory exactly via the anal gland via yep. the okay. anal glands which have this exquisitely smelling fluid in there and there and it's really very unpleasant Ugh. it's probably the nastiest job that vets have to do but unfortunately modern pet foods um quite rightly don't have as much hair or blood or skin in as as a natural diet for a dog would because they pick up all sorts of rubbish as you know out in the wild and so they don't empty their anal glands naturally as they would in the wild so we have to empty some dogs anal glands for them and it, I don't think it's terribly uncomfortable, as far as I can see. You and many dog owners will have seen their dogs scooting along the carpet. So when a dog scoots along the carpet, they're trying to empty their anal glands. Absolutely, that's wow. almost okay. Well, that's a mystery why. solved there. Yeah. Okay, I can proceed with the rest of my day. Yeah, okay, so, so this this owner says, 
You got to my my dog's ass needs to be managed. It's Can an you come? Urgent, and... urgent consultation requirement. That... Is it urgent for real? Well, I, in most cases, no. You'd expect them to be able to wait twenty four forty eight hours, um, and there wouldn't. There's no risk, um, but in this case. It was definitely an emergency as far as he was concerned. And so, <laughs> oh so I met this gentleman uh, at about 9.30 on fireworks night just to squeeze the dog's anal glands. Oh. And, uh, and, and job done. He was more than happy to pay the full out-of-hours consultation fee. So, so picking up on those subtle signs, he, to him the sign was it wouldn't jump up onto the sofa and yeah, keep him company him. on he a knew. Saturday night. He knew exactly. Picking up is really critical and, and we need to be very... Um, aware of what you're telling us. Okay. Now the flip side to that is, Doctor, you have to come out here because my my dog needs this done or my cat needs this done. That's me as a pet parent self-diagnosing. Clearly, that's not always the case, or that I don't always have Absolutely any right. idea what it is I'm talking about. Absolutely. So you've right. got to then very gingerly say, well. Yes, um, however, I think you're full of crap and that's not exactly the right thing <laughs> to do. Anyway, but back to when I dropped my cat off at the, at, the, uh, at the surgery and you have to take a history, then you perform... So we take a history yep. and we do a full clinical examination. So we do a full examination of the animal and, um, and that really is the main communication point to, to you. So if you've, if you've brought the, the dog or cat in and you say, well, it's lame on its left rear leg and and you expect us to look at the left rear leg first then we've got to explain to you that actually a full examination including looking in its mouth and and looking at its eyes and understanding its underlying health is really critical because what we don't want to do is just look at the the the, the lame poor or whatever sure. it is find a small problem and then find actually that this one opportunity because you've had to battle to get the cat into its carrier for us to look we've missed something really important. Mm -hmm. So we, do, we look at its whole health. And again, I think it's important to understand that's not just trying to, that's not trying to drum up business. It's just being aware that that left hind paw is attached to an animal whose health, general health is really, really important to us. Well, that's good common sense too. That, that yeah. makes sense. And also, I mean, the, the other thing is that you can be lame because you've got a, a, a small thorn in your paw or you might have a small thorn in your paw and, a, and it might have caused a really nasty systemic infection which means that you'll have a temperature mm -hmm. and uh, and you'll be feeling crap and uh, and you'll need antibiotics whereas actually a small thorn removed and there's no temperature and no infection you don't need antibiotics so we're making decisions for uh, further down the line mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on that examination. So the next part of the process, we've done, we've taken the history, we've got the examination. So the next part of the process is really critical for people to understand. Most pet owners that come into us want an answer. Yeah, I and, do. And they, I, yeah. I, I, but I want an answer when I go to any doctor. And you completely, under, we completely understand that. But to get an answer in so many conditions that we see is going to cost hundreds of pounds. So to get an absolute defined answer of what is the diagnosis might cost hundreds of pounds. And we're all aware from our own health and from watching our animals that there's a lot of things, just day-to-day -day ill health issues that, that appear to get better on their own. Now, of course, they don't get better on their own. They get better because our immune systems are fighting them. We take some rest and they, they repair. So there's all sorts of processes going on inside the body to, to repair us. But what we don't want to do is spend hundreds of pounds of your money. So, so yeah. maybe you don't walk out with a firm diagnosis. But what you should work, walk out with is a plan. Yeah. What well, are we going to do? That's like my cat, Charlie, is 13. He's yeah. got a thyroid condition. He's got hyperthyroidism. So my vet has said there are a couple of different things that are um, that could be going on. But what we have to solve for first is fixing the thyroid. So he's been on thyroid medicine. He's done really well. He's he's chunked up. He's in fine fettle. And now the vet says, okay, now we have to attack some of the other things that we think are wrong that might have been masked by the thyroid. First of all, some things the thyroid has resolved and others are like he's got now something wrong with his teeth. But the doctor really had the plan of wanting to look at solving for the big thing first because yeah, then sure. when you get that out of the way, it the other things are clear to see whether they're actually issues or not. Yep. And that it's all muddled in the beginning. Yeah. 
Um, but it, it, it's, it's hard to communicate that I'm, I'm sure. And it's also, it's a, that's a long process. That means I have to keep bringing my cat into the vet back to the initial stress in my life, which is putting my poor cat through all of that. Absolutely. And I, we, we completely understand that. I mean, there are so many underlying, um, particularly endocrine, so hormonal conditions that will affect your immune system. And if they affect your immune se- system, then it makes it more likely that you will have infections that are going to cause you an issue. So, um, for instance, bad teeth, having gingivitis, which is the infection around, around the teeth, may be the problem that you're worried about because you bring the animal in with, with bad breath and, and you, you're not actually liking it. it seems My to... darling Charlie and Henry, their <laughs> breath smells like roses. Roses, Chris. As you can gather, everybody, Charlie and Henry are on a pedestal <laughs> that means that poor Gabrielle's husband finds himself either at third or fourth place in the house. Um, yeah, <laughs> without a doubt, yes. So um, you bring them in because they, you, you're worried about their breath or the ease with which they're eating. And yet, actually, their primary problem is that they've got a hormonal condition. Now, it's a difficult thing to explain, particularly in a short consultation, that you came in because the animal's got bad breath or bad teeth and whatever, and we're going to help you sort that out. But, But our examination has led us to believe that it's worth taking a blood sample to identify if they've got a hormonal condition too. And actually the hormonal condition might be a much more important issue yeah. because if we can fix that, we can prevent some of these other infections that their lowered immunity is leading to them having. So what do you think is the biggest misconception that pet parents have about the whole process? So, I mean, from certainty. your side of the certainty. So certainty. you, the biggest misconception is that I'm going to walk in and you're going to be able to tell me exactly what's going on. Yeah. And you're saying... Do you know what? There's a really good chance I'm not going to have a clue or that I'm not, Absolutely. I'm not going to I mean, what, the three words which are probably most valuable for us to be able to say to you, but, but to have that mutual understanding and trust uh, involved with are, I don't know. But Chris, how do I know if you're a good vet and you just don't know, or maybe you're just a crappy vet? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm being. Yeah, yeah, how yeah. Do I know? Sure. I mean, and I guess that. I guess in. <laughs> I guess in general. I guess in general do you practice. Think I'm going to get blacklisted. No, no, no. In general practice, I think that comes down to results. So I think that really does come back down to results and trust. You know, it, the plan is the most important thing. You know, you've come in with an animal with a problem. And you might be expecting, because you've seen on television or you've seen on the internet or you've, you've experienced specialist care yourself, the sort of level of diagnosis that you, you get in specialist care. Now, specialist care, we're talking about referring to somebody who has a specific interest in, say, um, bones, lameness or whatever. And, and they will expect to get a diagnosis, but after several hundred pounds spent. Yeah. In general practice, the, the vets that people see from day to day you don't want to spend several hundred pounds every condition, but if the odds are that with a with a perfectly sensible plan, they'll get better, despite not having that defined diagnosis. So it definitely comes down to trust, and that's down to communication between us and you. So it's it's a it's a sense that that we all have as people dealing with people that that what this person is telling me is is a reliable um, plan, and and if 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 things don't go right, we also have to accept that it's that uncertainty. We, 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 we don't know that every decision we make is always going to lead to the resolution of, of the issue you've come yep. in with. But, but if, they, if it doesn't go right, that's not because it was a bad vet. And that isn't because it was a bad decision of you and the vet to decide to go down a particular path. But it definitely means it needs changing, revising. We need to think again. Okay. And that's where we need to communicate. And too often I hear that people didn't want to contact the vet because yeah, the vet didn't. It, what the vet did, it didn't work. But actually, that's all part of the process. And so, it, it communication's absolutely key. Here. Yeah. Well, that's a truism for life, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, come on. Yeah. So, in the interest of time, we, I've got one more one more question. I, I want you to give me an example in your practice of the the absolute worst thing I can do as a pet parent? Like what's what's the worst pet parent who walks in and you think, oh my God, I don't want to deal with this person. They're <laughs> horrible. And then what's the best? What does it, what are the yeah, parents who come in and, and you're like, oh, like? come on in. Exactly. Yeah. What do good and bad look like what? as far as a pet parent is concerned? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. What sure. should I know the next time I walk into my vet? Sure. How am I so, going to make them love me? So the worst, the worst time, uh, uh, um, pet parents for us are the ones that have the answer before they come in. <laughs> so they are well, and that's to the heart of Cat Dog Fish's mission is to, yeah. is, to is to solve for that. So yeah. when when they absolutely believe they know what's wrong with their animal because they they care. They care. We, the motive is not being argue, uh, argued with here, but they, they, they've looked it up on the internet. They've spoken to their friends. They've, they've all got um, uh, a huge amount of knowledge from lots of different sources, and they feel they know exactly what's going on. Right. And, and, and then we've got a communication battle to try and get them off that particular yeah. thought and onto a path of investigation again, starting from scratch. And so some people come in and they say, I, I just want you to give my dog antibiotics because I know it's got an infection. Now, they may but well be right, and, and we'll be delighted to, to help them with that. But, but actually, when they come in knowing what's wrong, or they feel they know what's wrong, and, and they won't let you potentially get a word in edgeways if you're trying to go off on another tack, um, they're often bringing in 101 different sometimes dubious therapies that they've tried and they've used <laughs> and and those those i have to say are yeah. down in the nightmare client point, uh, point okay. away. so the, and and then good good is is absolutely when you feel that you're working with somebody who wants to work with you on getting their animal right so i've got one owner who thinks they're the funniest person in the in the county and sadly <laughs> isn't but that's fine. Um, and is very outspoken and uh -huh. very loud and very um, uh, determined. American, in other in words? No, or? no. Oh, not no. American. Right. Okay. But, but they are one of the best pet owners that I've got because if you ask them to do something, they do it. And you know that they will have done absolutely what was discussed and what was uh, um, uh, decided to do. And, and they go home they do it and when it comes back and it hasn't worked we have a discussion and we work together and they and you know that they've complied with our uh, so you've just learned to laugh at their jokes yeah well done <laughs> thanks chris well this has been great and uh now the next time i take the cats in i'll have a better understanding of what's going on and hopefully you will too talk to you soon bye thanks gab for information on how to take expert care of your pet, go to catdogfish.com. <laughs>